This is Linux Unplugged, episode 18, for December 10th, 2013. And welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that currently has more raw computing power than the NSA. My name is Chris. My name is Matt. Hey, Matt, I'm surrounded right now by, let me count them down, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven screens. Wow. Yeah. That's a lot of screens. Yeah, it's a lot of computers right now. So we're in the middle of this big hardware roundup where we're reviewing different uh, gadgets from uh, System76, different machines. And I just hooked up today... The Leopard Extreme. I actually hooked it up late oh, last my. night, and it, it, so they sent it to me with 64 gigabytes of RAM. Oh, <laughs> you gotta love that, yeah. you know. And I'm, I'm just gonna tell you too. I uh, I decided to go for it. I installed Arch on the uh, Ultra Pro. Nice. Yeah, I got choice. so I got KD4 with Arch, and I actually went a different direction this time. Uh, I huh? had problems with Integros, like the I don't know if it was the repos or what was going on. The install wasn't working. I love Integros, but it just wasn't working out. So, what exactly were you experiencing? Was it uh, just not installing, like, it crashing? Would get, it or? would get, like, no, no, it was fine. It was fine. It would get through, like, 70, 80% of the installation process, and then it would just seem to start timing out on pulling down a package. I don't oh, know if weird. it was the Arch Repo issue at the time or what it was. Yeah. So huh. I jumped over and tried out Bridge Linux, which huh? uh, is sort of along the same vein as Integros in the sense that they use straight Arch Repos, mm -hmm. and they let you pick, like, your different desktop, and they let you choose KDE right out of the box, which is what I wanted. And... Uh, it's definitely not quite as uh, smooth as Integros. Like it's a it's a right. straight up command line installer, but it has like an Ncurses interface. Not um, bad. It, it's it's a little more. Uh, it's it's not it's it's definitely more power users. It's not quite as user friendly as Integros is, but it got it installed, and now I have a completely current uh, Arch installation. And it took about you know twenty five minutes. It was so it was an interesting experiment because I'd never tried it. Um, yeah, it's interesting. We'll, I'm going to check that out myself. I well, think one of the other things I thought was kind of interesting to uh, overuse the word already. Is I also tried Manjaro, uh, but ah. uh, Manjaro suffered from the same exact problem Integros did. Did I mean, it really? So that's why I was thinking it might have been a repo issue. But I, it must be. Yeah, I mean it's really hard to say exactly what was going on. The only thing I've ever experienced as far as a Manjaro versus Integros uh, situation was that one Ethernet, that one Broadcom Ethernet driver issue, to where uh, uh, Integros was not having it and it couldn't install because get this it couldn't get to the internet <laughs> you know and of course there was no detection on the uh, wireless front and of mm -hmm. course you're uh, not getting any love on the ethernet front it kind of uh, means you can either go the long way through Kansas personally it'd just be easier to install arch at that point but um, I just went with Manjaro on it and it worked out okay well uh, so I want to apologize up front I uh, I'm not really so sick anymore like I feel fine but I still have um, some junk in my throat so uh, and it's fine unless I talk which is not really... That could be a problem. You know, actually, now that I think about it, it's kind of a problem. So you might hear... Yeah. I'll try to mute my mic from time to time, but I do have a little junk in there. Uh, that give me an opportunity to yammer on. So that's yeah, okay. that's true. And, you know, uh, I have... Uh, it's not the best solution, people, but I, it's all I have to work with, is a little 100-proof <laughs> peppermint shot schnapps. Schnapps. You can see it's already working. It's got the tongue feeling good. Uh, hmm. So I'll be uh, sipping on that as the cough comes up. But uh, I wanted to touch on something before we go on, Matt, because uh, I have a little more things to say on the System 76 right. stuff, but... Of course, as is to be expected on the internet, uh, there was a critique, and of course, Stowolf2 in our subreddit, who saw it fit to post the same thing twice in the thread, uh, said that uh, the whole show was more or less a big commercial this time. This is, he's talking about our System76 right. laptop special from Season 29, Episode 10 of Last that came out on Sunday. I really hope it won't take that long before they're finished this, because I have no interest whatsoever of this kind of thing, and I really hope they got paid quite a bit. I'm willing to go through a couple of them if it means shows will continue, but I cringe myself the whole time wanking off a sponsor the whole episode this week. So hmm. I think there's a bit of an assumption here that this was a paid. Yeah, and that's and well, first of all, there was no wanking that was happening <laughs> to my knowledge. At least, at least there, I didn't get any anything there. But um, no, I would definitely say that this is based on the fact that we're celebrating 
and reviewing uh, hardware that is built to run Linux. Yes, they are a sponsor. Yes, I've also been using myself as of you, been using these guys long before the Linux eyes ever on the Linux Action Show. Right. So I'm, sp- you know, and I've been promoting them way before I had anything to do with them. Right. So, you know, these are products and services, these are products we're actually excited about. So, you know, at least from my perspective. And that's what we're doing. So, uh, that's you know, exactly so, it. Yeah. There really, I mean, uh, we didn't, there was, uh, there was no exchange of money. Yeah. Um, Matt and I asked to be sent these computers. We didn't uh, tell them how to spec them or anything like that. We don't get to keep them. I mean, God, that'd be awesome. And I, no, I, I also would know. argue, I, it, I don't think we got nef- necessarily preferential treatment either. Right. Um, I think, we, you know, they just as they became available, they were sent to us. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. We, and there was a waiting list. Yeah. Um, and it really, uh, and you'll notice, uh, so the way the System76 sponsorship works is uh, System76 sponsors a particular segment, not the entire show. Right. And we move exactly. that segment sponsorship out of the System70, the, the review. Like we'll, well do next I, week when we're talking yeah. about the Leopard Extreme. Absolutely. And another thing that happened on Google+, Plus, and I'm finally glad is taking place, is the old, well, they're rebranded such and such and whatnot. And I'm really excited to see that Carl came out of the woodwork and actually uh, addressed this. And I'll actually uh, we'll provide it maybe in the show notes as to what he responded to. But he was actually talking about you know what makes them different, how you know what System76 does to actually ensure that they're compatible, the custom BIOS, hint, hint. Right, the uh, hardware like, keys for yeah, the function exactly. keys. Um, right. And in you the know, case of my Bonobo, the modification so that the GPU yeah. would work properly under Linux. And not just exactly. under Ubuntu, but all Linux, right? Which, is, right? which was later on. I mean, at the time I bought it to run Ubuntu, but then later exactly. on I decided to run Arch. So there's all this stuff that they don't spend because, you know, this is no value to, to you guys to sit there and for them to ramble on about all this stuff. But it, this is all the stuff that's actually happening behind the scenes that make these guys unique. Right. And uh, I think it's pretty ex- I think it's pretty exciting. So are they Clevo based? Yes. That's the are base. Cle- right. Yeah, they're based. But there's a yeah. lot of extra stuff that you're not seeing. But unfortunately, right. it's easier a lot of times to from an armchair, you know, from an easy chair to point. Well, it's just rebranded. You know, so there's, so you there's, got that whole there's changes at the hardware level. Yeah. But then there's yeah. also uh, there's the support angle of it, which right. for some folks matters a lot more than other folks. And what I come back to at the end of the day is the strongest statement we can make as Linux users, and this is one of the reasons why, even though I don't play all of them, I often pick up a Steam game, Mm -hmm. is there is nothing more powerful than Linux users voting with their wallet. And in the Linux ecosystem, especially in the free software world, there's not always a lot of opportunities to clearly make your voice be heard. And the thing is, is... One of the reasons why I've been buying, this, and they don't sponsor this show, right? They don't. Right. They don't exactly. They don't sponsor Unplugged. I can say whatever I want, but the truth is, the reason why I've been buying them for seven, eight years is because that money goes to, into a company that then continues to push the desktop Linux agenda forward, right? Right. And and so the thing is, is I know, like a, for example, a lot of people love uh, Lenovo ThinkPads, uh, and and they probably are. I don't actually, I haven't had one for a while, but they often are very good hardware. But the problem at the end of the day is. That purchase is actually voting for the Windows uh, desktop because exactly. they're not they're not counting it as like an Ubuntu desktop machine. They're not they're not counting it like that. Plus, on top of that, there's the aspect of the interaction with the community, the with the drivers, uh, the Ubuntu forms, and all of that that I really respect. I respect a company that actually follows the community and doesn't just get Linux, but actually actively participates in it. And it's not that I I I. Uh, I don't no disparity for anybody that wants to buy a Lenovo. You buy whatever hardware works best for you. Everybody, there's. I mean, I've got Macs in the studio. Okay, so I understand yep. there's hardware out there that does what you need to do, and you need to buy it. My point is, is that is a vote, and uh, that's like when I do decide to buy a Mac. That internally for me is a very long process of the, of yeah. reflection that I go through, and I spend way more time than I should, like specking out a Hackintosh, trying to figure out how to not vote with my wallet. Because that is the most powerful vote, and that's another reason why I, I like System76 quite a bit. And all of that plays a factor into when I look at a System76 unit and I think, you know, this is something for Linux, and how good is it in, in, in that context? And uh, that's why, they, for me, uh, I, I, you know, Ultra Pro is, it, 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 I was like, this, not only did it change my perspective on Ultrabooks, because obviously as somebody has the Bonobo, I'm kind of a, you know, as much power as I can cram in there. Uh, but it also changed my perspective on Intel graphics, which exactly. I think in the long run is going to be the biggest thing I carry forward from this review is just how far the Iris graphics have come. Uh, and again, you know, the Linux games aren't the most demanding games on the market. Uh, I really haven't seen anything that the uh, 680 and my Bonobo can't just chew through without ultimate settings. So it's not, it's maybe not a fair test. Maybe it wouldn't perform as well under Windows. I don't know. I didn't mm-hmm. try. But I loaded Half-Life 2 on this Ultra Pro under Arch using Steam. And it was it was butter smooth. It, I didn't I didn't I didn't even adjust any of the video settings. I just wanted to get in game and see like could I 
get enough frame rates to actually expect to be able to shoot somebody. And it was like, it was as if I was playing on an embedded video. And I understand that Half-Life 2 is not, you know, it didn't just come out. It's not the most current game. But at the same time, I, I it's the way I look at it is if you're looking at getting an ultra book, gaming for you is probably not the first priority. It's probably more like something you do on a social occasion. And I think it's secondary. Yeah, right. It's, it's something you might like to be able to do, but it's not going to it's not going to decide the purchase. And I feel like the embedded graphics are now at that level. And that's extremely exciting for me because Intel graphics are a, a cheap. Uh, they're mm-hmm. low power, yeah. uh, if you consider the Intel chip, too. Uh, and also open source, the drivers, right? So you have open source drivers, which is great. And not only do we have open source drivers, but Intel has shown us that they will work with the Linux kernel team uh, one generation out. So while uh, one generation's on the market, before Haswell even hit the stores, they already had drivers into the to the Linux kernel. And to me, that's huge. So I'm yeah. really excited to see where that goes. And so it, they haven't paid for any special treatment. We asked to be sent the hardware. We wanted to check it out because in, in you know both Matt and I's uh, opinion, this is the premier Linux hardware vendor. Well, and my own personal desktop computer is an old – I mean, hell, I've got my my laptop behind me from 2008. It's a System76. It still works. I've got a pile of laptops in front of me from other companies that don't work any longer. So, you know, I think the quality is certainly reasonable in that regard. And I've had good experiences with them um, coming from an old PC repair background and watching people <laughs> – buy crap and then get all butthurt over it when their stuff doesn't work anymore. I really value uh, quality. I don't want to, you know, and that, that's not just the product, but also the service and the way I'm treated. Um, and that's a big part of it for me as well. Yeah. So I, uh, on my Google Plus uh, uh, um, page, I posted some hardware porn of the uh, internal of the Leopard <laughs> no, Extreme. Yeah. And mm. uh, it, this is a really well-built computer. And I'm looking at it as a, uh, as a Mac Pro competitor. Um, so, the unit they sent me, 64 gigs of RAM and uh, a six-core Intel i7 processor. And for, for so what I want to discover, what I want to try to figure out is a lot of, once I'm done editing a show, I hand it off to FFmpeg on different computers right. throughout my house. And through benchmarks, I've determined uh, which computers are best at encoding which versions. Some are better at shrinking video down and then at putting out an iPod-friendly format. And some are better at doing... Uh, just straight uh, encoding to 720p with no scaling. And it's oh, that's all, interesting. Yeah, there's so you're, all, so you're saying that different machines actually specialize more so in different encoding techniques than right, other machines. Right, ah. Yeah, and so I'm wondering where this thing falls down. Like, so, I mean, what would be incredible, and I don't actually know if, it's a, if it can be accomplished, is mm-hmm. if this machine could make web and video encoding economical. Because right now... What happens on the Jupiter Broadcasting website is I I post a, a show and I usually use the YouTube embed for a, sometimes a couple of days because the web and video takes so long to encode that I often just don't get back to it till a couple of days down the road. So I can't use HTML5 video. And so I'm hoping that this might be the machine that makes H- WebM doable. We'll see. I don't know yet. Boy. I got a lot of things I'm going to be throwing at it, but... Uh, hmm. Pretty cool. I got it under my desk right now, sitting right next to it. <laughs> and I got a nice Logitech G19 keyboard hooked up to it. So I'm like, I'm I'm Wait. full in. Yeah, I'm like, I'm enjoying it. Uh, all right, Matt. Well, we got a couple of emails uh, we should get into. The first one is getting girls on Linux. Uh, this was a response ah. to some comments we made on a recent show. Did you want to read this one? Yeah, let's get over to that. Girls on Linux. Getting girls on Linux. Yeah, okay. getting girls, which I think was a, it was a pickup from a topic we touched on last week. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to try not to butcher this here as we go. Uh, as a female who discovered Linux in college, I wanted to add my own response to the questions on how to get girls to use Linux. Okay, interesting enough. The most important reason for someone to switch uh, so I'm reading I'm reading word for word, so it's going to be a little butchered. The most important reason for someone to switch OS is is uh, is not who will be doing their tech support. So, okay, I think basically what they're saying with that was regarding the tech support. Okay, moving on to the next piece. Uh, it is how – let me make that bigger so I can see it. Hang on just a minute. Uh, probably reread that. All right, let's try it again. Let's see. Uh, it is not. It is how they. Sw- it's how they switch that will make their life easier. Any female studying STEM in college. I studied physics and used tons of open source software in my research. Using Linux is a great way to separate yourself when applying for research positions. That's actually a really good point. Okay. Uh, it also offers aw- some awesome creative outlets for other majors as well. Liberal arts students should love the freedom and ideals that Linux offer to the user. Most importantly, it can save them a ton of money, which is also true. Great point. Yeah, excellent point. Okay. I know it wasn't your intention to demean women. However, 
Let's stop focusing on women as outliers who need a different type of convincing than men and why to use Linux. The benefits the, the benefits of Linux apply to all genders equally. I think that really summarizes in that last yeah. sentence. Yeah, I think this is something too that yeah. really resonated with me is uh, mm-hmm. I, I kind of feel like it's insincere when a bunch of guys talk about how to get women into technology. That kind of seems like... But, and I can't speak for you, Chris, but I know talking with my wife... Um, there is absolutely a thing there, not because she's a woman, because but because she looks at task management and various things differently than I do. Because yeah. hold on to your hats, kids, because of gender. So I think it's know. interesting because I, at one end, like what what's going to draw women into technology? It's going to be the same thing that sure. draws men into technology. But when you look at the actual end use cases, like in the home, my wife right. and I use technology very differently. I would even say my wife's more effective with technology than I am in a lot of ways. I mean, because she, she does tend to work smarter. I'm the guy that does multiple trips to bring groceries into the house when she will find a way to do it in one or two trips. Yeah. So, I mean, there's definitely an effectiveness there. But I think at the end of the day, you know, I, I, I see what they're saying, but I definitely think that there are differences and that and they can be embraced in a healthy so- uh, you know, non-negative way. One thing I wanted to clear up is I think there was a misunderstanding. She said, you know, one of the things what's going to make women switch is who's going to be their tech support. I didn't mean it as in like women will switch to whatever the men will help them with. What I mean is usually when you're switching to something new, you're going to have the most success when other people in your in your immediate social group also use that same technology. Right. So that way they can share experiences or uh, provide sure. insights when you get stuck somewhere. I don't think it necessarily depends on – although it, in a sense, I guess that does mean who's going to be the tech support. That, but, well, but at the end of the day, honestly, if we want to really quit trying to be politically correct and be honest with ourselves, there are some things – like I'm, I'm very good at certain things that my wife's not good at. And my wife's very good at things that I'm not good at, and they're not necessarily gender-specific, but some of them are. And you know, some of those things like, for instance, when it comes to actually planning out the layout of our home, that was my wife. Oh, uh, you guys are like peanut you know, butter and jelly. I know, right? So it's <laughs> <laughs> but I mean at the end of the day, it's like, you know, I, I don't want to be too sensitive about this because I, I, I you know, I, I don't it just doesn't really add any value to it. Yeah. Um yeah, I don't know. I it's it's a tough call. I definitely hear what she's saying and she's got some great points. I definitely like the benefits of all genders equally, but I think there are inherent differences mm. that we can embrace and do so in a positive way. So uh, moving on to the uh, – yeah. as a follow-up thread to the uh, topic of swap partitions, you know, we had a lot of interesting – in fact, I got a couple I'll get to here. Uh, Panda Brain wrote and he said uh, in the debate last week, no one mentioned swap files. Uh-huh. <laughs> Those are files that can be used for the same things as a swap partition is used for, i.e. offloading right. content from memory and hibernation. Unlike swap partitions, they can be created, removed, or resized on the fly. Uh-huh. There is no real disadvantage unless you use ButterFS, which just simply doesn't support them. You'll find more information about swap files in the always excellent ArchWiki, and he has a link to that. Um, <laughs> so the uh, the uh, swap partition thing, it's so funny, gosh. Um, you yeah, know, you really opened up a can of worms if this was a Linux, if this was a If this was a Windows podcast, it would be our should I defragment my drive topic. Like this is something Linux <laughs> users pine over all the time. And you know what? I think SSDs uh, have made it like even more... Uh, like now everybody's like, well, now I don't have very much space. I've, right. only, I've only got 128 gigabytes of space. Should I really give several gigabytes to my swap file? What am I even using that for? I've got eight gigs of RAM, right? That's what everybody's thinking. Oh, and, um, and and there are ways to to uh, to take advantage of hibernation without mm-hmm. the swap file. Uh, but, uh, but it probably requires a little bit of research. You actually got to kind of plan out what your goals are and decide which approach is best for you. And so, yeah, there's a little bit of homework involved. Yeah, yeah. We're going to get to the topic of the uh, swap file again, but uh, I wanted to uh, read some feedback we got uh, from Ray, which I actually been meaning to eat to uh, personally write Ray back, but I, I just uh, haven't done it yet. So this will be the first time I've addressed him. R- Ray wrote into the show and uh, he said, uh, hey, Chris, I'm one of the golden ticket winners uh, from Ting. I just want to say how happy I am. I have switched to their service. Uh, so I'm going to, so I wanted to say, you know, thank you, Ray, for doing this. This is an excellent right. point of, uh, so Ting is sponsoring this episode of Linux Unplugged. And I have to tell you, uh, I am a big fan of Ting. I've been telling you about Ting for a while now, and I think they're a great company. It's not just that I like their service, and it's not just that I like their pricing model, and it's not just that they have no contracts and no early termination fees, and, and that I own the phone, and that Hotspot and Tethering are included. And honestly, all of those things are what got me to switch to Ting, but they're not what keeps me at Ting. What keeps me at Ting is the fact that I'm, again, voting with my wallet, 
and I'm giving my money to a company that I'm really passionate about. So Ray Roney says, I signed up through the last URL and I purchased a Nexus S with a $25 discount. Nice. Uh, yeah, you can, you can get that same discount by going to linux.ting.com. He says, the phone arrived sooner than I expected and I couldn't be happier after working out a few bugs with tech support and later a new battery that cleared up some problems. It's been a little tight on cash flow for a long time and I'm getting, uh, and I have... And getting, and I have an $85 phone that has 4G and it's near showroom like condition plus a $400 credit that I will cover my cost for my Ting plan for the next year. Uh, he was on an Android 2.2.2 device before that his dog had slobbered up a little Whoa. bit. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I'd have been, by the way, he got a used Nexus S, which is a really great way to save money when you're switching mm-hmm. to Ting. He said, I, I would have been without a personal phone by the end of October if not taking advantage of the deal that was and the affordable service. I'm blessed with grateful and willing budgeting for my next device on Ting sometime next year. Maybe the Nexus 5. So uh, get started by going over to linux.ting.com. Ting is mobile that makes sense. They're my mobile service provider and Matt's mobile service provider. Currently, I've got the HTC One and the Nexus 5 on Ting service, and it's awesome because they have a great dashboard that lets me see exactly where each phone is at. I can put one phone on suspend if I'm not going to use it for a little while. There's tons of really nice things in the Ting dashboard, but really the great thing about Ting is you only pay for what you use. They take your messages, your minutes, and your megabytes, and they they add them all up at the end of the month. Whatever bucket you fall into, that's just what they charge you for. You want to turn on Tethering for a little while? Do it! Because, son, it's only $6 <laughs> a month flat, and then you only pay for what you use on top of that. Average Ting bill is between $21 and $33 a month. Think about that. What are you paying right now on your smartphone? Go over to linux.ting.com and click that how much would you save button right in the middle of the page. Put your current stuff in there. Put your just put your bill in there. I'm not I'm not judgy. Just put your bill in there and see how much you're paying right now and compare that to Ting. Because I've got I've got Hotspot and Tether. I've got an up-to-date Android phone that is awesome that I own that I only pay for what I use, and I have no contract, and there's no early termination fee. I'm truly in control, and as these mobile devices become more popular, as this computing platform becomes the norm, these are the little details that will matter the most. And you can get started by going to linux.ting.com. And don't worry, if you're in a contract right now, Ting has an early termination relief program, and they'll take up to $75 per line that you have to cancel. It's super easy. All you have to do is go over to Ting, get your phone, Port your number and then submit your ETF claim. That's early termination fee. Submit your ETF claim to Ting and they'll take care of you. So go get started by going to linux.ting.com. And a huge thanks to Ting for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. And congratulations to Ray for becoming a golden ticket winner. Isn't that awesome? You know, it's so cool. It is so cool. And also, um, I don't want to steal thunder, but uh, we have a little announcement (laughs) to make on the faux show. Somebody, Uh Somebody just got a whole bunch of service, too. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's get back on this topic. I got a big one. I got a big one on uh, swap files, Matt. Are you ready for a little more? Uh, I think I'm ready. I can only imagine. So there's only one way to take a swap conversation and make it better, and that's to bring in ZRAM and Hibernate, right? I mean, that's really going to take the next. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, uh, boy. That just, that's really <laughs> overcomplicating it. Oh, my goodness. Okay. All right, so uh, Kevin writes in. Hey, Kevin. He says, uh, hi, Chris and Matt. I'm glad you brought up the topic of swap. Uh, despite the uh, beardiness of the topic, it's something I've been following since SSD price drops and two gigabytes of RAM have made a swapless system not just possible, but perhaps desirable. With the community having a greater experience about it, I wanted to toss around a few ideas to the Jupiter Broadcasting audience. All right, Matt. So uh, I'm going to uh, activate our mumble room for this one, too, so that All way right. they can answer. All right. So question number one, and I pose this to the mumble room. I've heard good things about ZRAM but I don't want to spare a machine to test on it yet. Has anyone replaced your swap file with ZRAM? Will it work with hibernation? Is performance under heavy load better than disk-based swap? Anyone in the mumble room tried ZRAM yet? If only I, and was here. I tried it on, um, I have a, an AC100, which is an arm ba- a Toshiba ARM-based uh, laptop. Sure. It, it shipped with um, Android, Android and um, we replaced Android with Ubuntu. And memory was a bit tight, so we used ZRAM or ZRAM as we call it uh, over here. Right. Um, and really didn't notice any difference at all. It was fine. <laughs> and how much RAM did you think? Do you think the system? Do you remember how much it had in it? Physical RAM? A gig. Oh gosh, I'd have no idea. Okay. Two five so six five, maybe. The other thing. Inside the five twelve or a gig, because I remember looking at it. It's a Tegra two based system. Yeah, it's pretty lean. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. The other thing to note is that ZRAM does not fix the hibernation problem. Oh, yeah. okay. Okay. This period does not fix it. Okay. There is no way to currently hibernate, which does not require you to write to disk at some point your contents of RAM. Right, because you're powering down the RAM. Exactly. Yeah. 
Uh, okay. now, it, when, now, I don't get why there isn't some solution that creates, like on Windows, creates a hibernation file separate from swap if you don't wish to have a large swap file that matches the amount of RAM you have. Mm. Hmm? Yeah, let's Another go. thing I've been noticing, just on my uh, main machine, is that ever since kernel 3.8, for some reason, ZRAM causes a kernel panic when enabled. After what? a certain amount of time, just randomly, wow. it'll kernel panic, and I don't even know why. What distro is this? Any distro. With anything it's after 3.8? Anything after 3.8. Wow, that is weird. Linus, is weird. damn it. Uh, no. <laughs> so, okay, now here's... Let's let's talk about swap files specifically. So, oh. uh, Kevin wants to know, is there a big difference between swap files and swap partitions? If the system partition and swap are on the same disk, I can't see where an improvement would be, especially since I could remove or add swap files with much less hassle than a swap partition. Now, I have a theory, but has anybody actually tried swap files? No. All right, so here's, so here's my theory on the swap partition. This is just a raw space that the kernel can write to. And I got to believe that is faster than going through the file system driver and all, whatever it is, ButterFS, Extended 4. I have to believe it is, it is a much more direct connection when you have a raw partition space that is just only for swap. That would be you my would belief. think so. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you would think it would it would be a straighter shot anyhow. Yeah. Mm. All right. So uh, he goes on to ask about USB 3.0 flash drives being cheap enough and maybe storing swap on there. No. See, the one problem with uh, USB is that it uses the CPU for the, for the controller logic, so you're going to have CPU load for doing that. I just don't think that's a good idea in general. Uh, he said, it sounded like some of the Mumble members would go swapless if not for Hibernate, and he includes a link where we can find out more information from the Debian wiki. How about that? A plug for the Debian wiki Woo! on run, at least running Debian uh, Hibernate without a official swap file. So there you go. All right. So uh, he says, uh, thanks for relieving my ramblings. Well, Kevin, thank you for uh, emailing in. That was a good one. Yeah, I, very good. I thought that was a, uh, a good little Re topic. All right. Really well thought out, too, I think. Yeah, it's funny how, like, there's, a, there's just the semantics, you know, where you, you think about these kind of things. Like, honestly, when I was uh, resetting up this Ultra Pro, I was like, should I make a swap partition? <laughs> right, yeah, exactly, because, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, just, unless you're running, like, OpenSUSE, and you just import what, it, what you're working Yeah, with. I mean, I decided to go for it, but, yeah, okay. All right, well, I wanted to remind everyone that we'll be doing a double recording on Tuesday the 17th, starting at 12 p.m., so we're going to start early. Oh, boy. Don't forget, Matt. I almost I actually forgot until yeah, I read that. <laughs> I, got, I got multiple entries in my uh, my phone as well as uh, other uh, actually both of my smartphones. So and they beep and squeal all day long, so I don't forget. Yeah, you know. So okay, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna start at 12 p.m. Pacific um, uh, over at JBLive.tv uh, on next week on Tuesday the 17th. We won't be live on the 24th, which is Christmas Eve. And so we're re we're pre-recording. And I'll tell you, this show, it, it, having, having uh, no topics and just going off the cuff is fine for one episode. <laughs> I don't know about two episodes. It might devolve yeah. into another Star Trek review. No, I'm kidding. But uh, <laughs> show up and hang out in our mumble room. You'll have uh, more opportunity to do so. Uh, so we'll uh, go to that. Matt, uh, speaking of uh, opportunity and things that you've been dealing with, uh, I know, uh, were you dealing with car troubles earlier today? Okay, yeah. I mean, just re keeping it real loose here. Basically, I had I known for some time, and I'm sure uh, uh, Ange and uh, Chris have certainly heard it as I'm pulling in or pulling out. My car likes to squeal like it's dying a horrible, painful death. And so, I, you know, <laughs> I have a trusted mechanic, a very good guy here locally that I take it to, top of the line fella. Well, anyway, shaving a few things off, even relying on a battery warranty, I'm looking at just under a thousand dollars. Oh uh, my gosh! Yeah, and it's like I, I'm literally going to be delivering phone books to pay for it right now. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, so you got to do the belt things. for the belt. Oh, no, 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 no. It, I need a new axle. I've what? got, I, I got all kinds of stuff. And I actually went, I went to, uh, I had a second mechanic look at it to make sure. And yeah, it, it's the real deal. It, there's a number of things that are going to be, uh, I'm going to see with the timing belt. I think it's the other one or time. Yeah. Timing belt was the other one. There's a number of things I'm looking at. So yeah. So definitely been, uh, you know, it's just one of those tough life life lessons. But yeah. the good news is, is uh, it's it's going to be possible. So yeah. that's what's awesome. Man, you know? I'll tell you what. So <laughs> car yeah. problems, and they have a great way what? of coming like at the worst time ever. Well, it's December, right? I mean, clearly this is when you do it. 
travel. <laughs> now, do you have like a business that you can like say that the vehicles for the business travel? Uh, do you have? No, some? I at one time yes, but not anymore because yeah. I don't because I don't work outside of the house really. I mean, I do kind of, but not really as much as I used to. I I don't just it, mathematically the accountant actually said it's easier to go this other way. Re- thinking rethinking that now, but um, no, I really can't. Um, so you know, it's just it's just one of those things to where you just gotta you know stomach it and uh, move on. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, for us, the biggest <laughs> upset has been this whole Amazon affiliates yeah. thing. And it's it's been interesting because when I set up the uh, the uh, Amazon affiliates program, I set up like four or five of them. I can't remember. I set up, like, I think it was four because I was going to do an affiliate ID for each show. Yeah. And then I realized the way the Amazon system works is by traffic base. So if you have everybody use one affiliate ID, you get, you know, better results, which is totally oh, so, legit. Yeah. So I had all these other accounts available. So when they shut down our account, uh, I I still have these other ones, so I thought, okay, let's see how these go. Of course, they've all they were all <laughs> systematically shut down within a period of time, including my wife's account, which is on her her momvault dot com blog, completely unrelated to Jupiter Broadcasting. It's just her own personal blog where she sells. If she talks about a mom product, a mommy product that she bought from Amazon, she'll put a link yeah. to it with the affiliate ID. But it's like straight up, like that's all she uses it for. Yeah, yeah. it's not involved with our company at all. And they still shut even that account down. Really? Is it based on – I wonder if they're like looking at address or what the hell. I mean – or last name or I don't understand. I, I It's got to be address, right? Yeah, it's got to be, right? I mean because so, you get 10 versus SSN and all that. I, I don't know. That's I'll weird. tell you. It's, it comes kind of at a sucky time because – so the the early 2014 window was we, where we were going to start up. I have a townhouse that I own that is currently rented out. And my, my idea was is I will take that townhouse – and I will convert it into, I will ask the renters to vacate, and then I will convert it into a studio. And part of that would also be hiring a full-time person to operate the studio. And then what I would do, and this is the part that I really want to do, and I even if we can't do the new studio, I still want to figure out a way to do this. So I'm putting the call out to the Linux Unplugged audience, is I want to take Tuesdays, and I want to go on location to a company in the greater Seattle area that is using Linux. Ah, yeah. I mean, Valve would be the dream, right? But oh, any, yeah, right. <laughs> any company, <laughs> yeah. any company. And I want, I mean, I'm asking for a lot. I mean, I realize this up front, but what I want to do is I want to go there. And here's my thought, man. And just totally, it's totally economical in terms of production senses. Yeah. I want to go down there on a Tuesday. I want to spend the morning shooting a segment for the Linux Action Show. And then I want to spend the afternoon doing a podcast from their office and maybe bring in like their sysadmin, right? Bring in somebody who works with Linux on site, have them sit down on microphone with us. And, you know, you could be there in person sometimes and sometimes you'd be on Skype, whatever, whatever works for you that week. We bring it all in and we'd have somebody back at the studio who could switch it. So I'd Skype in. Maybe I'd buy myself a Galago Ultra Pro and uh, have you utilize this nice web- webcam. <laughs> I like that. Uh, <laughs> And that's that's my 2014 dream. So I don't know how we're going to pull that off. But if you are in the Seattle area and you would like to have us come and burden your office with our presence and uh, uh, abuse your bandwidth and ask you all kinds of personal probing questions about your Linux infrastructure, <laughs> email me, Chris at JupiterBroadcasting.com, because I want to start setting this stuff up. I want to start doing Linux Unplugged on location and then come back with something for last on Sunday. So we can, I mean, I think the, the opportunities here are great. Like you'll get the behind the scenes story here on Unplugged. You'll get all of like the nitty gritties, the stuff that we don't tell you about on last. It's just because we'll cut on last. We'll cut down and give you like, here it is. Boom, boom, boom. Here's the information. Here's the interview. Here's what they're doing. But on Unplugged, we're going to do it right there on location. We're going to bring their guys on. They're going to chat with us. And I think this, this could be a great opportunity. So if you are in the greater Seattle area, Chris at JupiterBroadcasting.com, let me know. And maybe we'll do uh, an episode on site in early 2014. I don't know oh, how. Cool. I don't know how we're going to pull that off. Oh, yeah. No kidding. One yeah. way we're going to pull it off is uh, we are rocking our uh, our Teespring. This is We've exceeded my, my greatest expectations. We're now at 722 of uh, 499 that we needed to unlock it. So uh, this I'm just mentioning it real quick. You have uh, five days and two hours left as of this recording to grab yourself a Jupiter Broadcasting Limited 2014 shirt or hoodie. Or ladies' tea. Hello. Oh, it's just women's tea. I, I think they should put ladies' tea in there. And I think they should say it that way with a little Barry White in the background. Ladies' you know? tea. Uh, also, uh, I've heard from uh, from our, from our Aussie viewers and and folks in Florida. I'm not kidding. Uh, they're happy that we have a short sleeve option as well, just a straight up tea. So if you want to get those, teespring.com slash Jupiter 2014. And uh, if you're listening to this uh, six days from when it was posted, it's too late. 
we won't have them anymore. Uh, before we get in, we got our mumble room back, and uh, I'm going to ask the mumble room if Linux user groups are dead. And uh, Matt and I are going to share experiences with some local Linux user groups who we both love, but we're going to talk about it. First, I want to thank our second sponsor this week, and that is DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean is cloud hosting made simple. They offer the most intuitive and easy way to spin up a cloud server. Users can create a cloud server in 55 seconds, and pricing plans start at only $5 per month, which gets you 512 megabytes of RAM, 20 gigs of SSD storage, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. DigitalOcean has data centers in New York, San Francisco, and Amsterdam. hey oh, The interface is simple, intuitive. The control panel lets you deploy a droplet. Super easy. I have, uh, right now, an Arch server up. Yes, I said Arch. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of my personal experimentation and uh, I'm going to keep I'm going to keep pushing it see how far I can take it. But one of the really cool things is if you want to try something out for a little bit. DigitalOcean also offers hourly pricing. Yes, hourly pricing if you want to spin I up a cloud that, server. Yeah. I know, and what's so awesome is you could create so like take my Arch machine that I have right now that has BitTorrent Sync and other goodies on there. I I have a I have a back backup snapshot of that. I can redeploy that dozens of times if I want, and only pay hourly. And there's something even better. Listeners of Linux Unplugged can take advantage of a special offer, Linux Unplugged December. Linux Unplugged December will get you a $10 credit when you check out. Use that promo code, a $10 credit. So if you're using the $5 machine like I am, well, that'll get you two months of that $5 machine. That's a pretty good deal. And I I, I invite you to take advantage of it because I I didn't actually fully appreciate how awesome DigitalOcean was until I spun up a server and I've really been enjoying it. DigitalOcean also has a really good community. And they, in fact, are trying to encourage that, sort of grow it a little bit. And so right now they're offering uh, those of you who want to create articles or tutorials for their community. If DigitalOcean selects the piece that you wrote, they'll give you a $50 credit. You can follow the link in our show notes to find out more about that. But if you think about it, the baseline server is $5 a month. Well, if they give you a $50 credit, that's going to get you going for quite a while. And at $5 a month, I'm thinking about taking... Uh, so right now I have an Arch server. And one of the criticisms of Arch is that, oh, it moves too much and that's scary because apparently we're all scared of our computers. So what, <laughs> really? <laughs> so what, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to also take advantage of Docker, something we talk about a lot. And Matt, my thought is, is why not take Docker and spin it up on Arch and create an Ubuntu LTS or a CentOS environment in that Docker instance, install things like Zimbra or, or whatever sort of productivity suite I want. It lives in this cocoon of protection, this, pr this cocoon of long-term support while it rides on top of that wily and crazy Arch OS. And of course, DigitalOcean will let you spin up instances with Docker ready to go. Also, the LAMP stock, totally configured CentOS, Ubuntu. They got a whole bunch on there. You go check it out. Go over to DigitalOcean.com. Linux Unplugged December is your promo code to get that $10 credit. That way you can check it out for a couple of months. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring Linux Unplugged. Plugged. Huge thank you. I love those guys. I love the fact that you have all that freedom and availability to actually really pick and choose the kind of lifestyle you want to lead on in the cloud. And it's know? so nice for like software development and testing yeah. for the hourly pay totally. as you go. That's super easy. All right, Mumble Room, are you back? Are you here? Yes, uh, we are. All right, so let's uh, put your flame retardant pants on and let's have a frank conversation about the state of lugs. Uh, uh, Popey very pointedly asked the question on the pre-show, are lugs dying? And and I think Matt and I both chimed up and said, with much respect and appreciation for both our local Everett and Bellingham Lug, it. which, by the way, our Bellingham Lug puts on Linux Fest Northwest yes. every year. So much respect. But it sometimes it kind of feels like it's last generation that's left at these lugs. Like, for example, in the Everett Lug, they're kind of famous for these are the guys you go to when you want to put Linux on a 486. Right. It's not it's not the kind of stuff I'm interested in anymore. I mean, I have a lot of respect for what they're trying to do, and I think it's really cool. And mm -hmm. I kind of want a 486 running Linux in my house. But at the end of the day, to get my work done, I'm looking at six core i7s. Right. So <laughs> exactly. Yep. So I wonder to you guys, uh, I wanted to start maybe Popey. Are you still here? Do you want to share your thoughts on the state of lugs? Because you were the, really the one that kicked this conversation off. Yeah. So this this came from um, I, I've I've been involved in the UK Linux user group scene for a few years and and I've I've been to my local Linux user groups there's three in a fairly small catchment area and when I first started going to them it was um 
There were lots of talks being given. Uh, we would video the talks and we'd put them online and uh, we'd get like 40 or 50 people in one county lug coming every month, uh, once a month. And uh, we'd debug people's issues. We'd uh, chat about various uh, like uh, salient newsworthy things that, yeah. that were going on. When was this? And, what year? Uh, this would be uh, probably about 10 10 or eight years ago, right? somewhere around about there. Right. Um, and then over the years, I've kind of noticed it drop off a bit. The, the amount of traffic in the various mailing lists on all the lugs in the UK has tailed off quite a lot. I mean, Poby, don't um, you think maybe the internet is killing the lug a little bit because we're more connected now where we go off into our community silos and we just hyper interact there? Sure. And, and I know when, when the Linux user group nearest me first started, it was one of these ones that was a mailing list on the end of a dial-up line. So, yeah, yeah. you know, you might get a batch of mail, you know, every every couple of days or something when the guy um, dialed in and, and processed all the, all, all the requests. Yeah. And now you, you, know, you can, you can uh, probably get an answer to your question before the modem has finished negotiating the call. So here's um, what I worry, though, is... Uh, um, there really, truly is something to that meet space connection. Like when I go to uh, Linux Fest Northwest or I go to PAX and I shake the hand of a, a Linux Action Show listener or, or I don't know, does Brian2040 leave? Like Brian2040. Yeah, no, I'm still here. Right. Like Brian2040, he was a name in the chat room until one day he's driving my truck home when I'm too sick to drive it, right? And they become real people. And exactly. and that meet space connection, I think, is easy to sort of undervalue on the internet. And I And I worry that... Lugs brought like it like now with like laptops and all of this, like lugs seem like they could do more good than ever, but I agree with Popey. It seems like they've faded big time. Yeah, so, and and I agree with you. There is there is that element of personal uh, interaction. You know, there there's the and I agree with you that there are some people of an older generation in our local lug. Uh, but that works in both ways. There's a guy who's recently had to go to hospital and spent time in hospital with a netbook and found that he it was difficult for him to type. So, yeah. you know, we rallied the troops and sent a mail to the lug and has anyone got a keyboard they can like, send him, you know, that kind of stuff. I feel like the reason why the lugs in my area are populated by the gray beards, the older guys is because they're more socially adjusted and they're more socially balanced because they haven't been perverted by the easiness of the internet that allows them to create these fake social connections that don't truly connect them at a human level to another person, which yeah, actual lugs do. And I feel like we're, yeah. we're losing something there. If I, if I may interject, because um, Linux Fest Northwest was like my first really big uh, festival I went to, at least in, in my experience. And, you know, from what I've heard, and it's just it just in in that sort of environment where it's more of a development festival, almost it feels like lugs are growing at the same time. Hmm. Um, I, I actually, back to what uh, Opie said a second ago, uh, you saying that lugs also were a place where you could actually get help. And Linux right. has really gotten to the point, honestly, like it's so easy to just help yourself now. Right. The Google I mean, factor. How easy it is yes. to take a USB stick and install a boot yeah. on it. Yeah. Like, you don't get it done in 20 minutes by yourself. Right. You Whereas you before, you go to a lug to have somebody walk you through the Slackware installation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I, I, don't really, I don't really agree with you guys because um, I'm one of the officers of the lug at uh, UCLA, uh -huh. uh, University of California, Los Angeles. And at least in my experience, we hold install fests um, every quarter. We give talks and stuff. And at least in the at least in our academic, um, like uh, the realm of students and stuff, a lot of people just are never introduced into Linux. And then by the time they do in classes or whatever, they are introduced to such a cursory level that they need an extra um, place to go to to get the kind of help they need. So do you, is the majority of your users group uh, fellow college students? Yeah, and then we also have some professors and people uh, from around the area. Okay. Um, I think a lot of, Los Angeles has scale, obviously, um, yeah. which I've been doing a couple times, which is an awesome conference. Um, but it does hap happen to, I mean, we have Media Temple and a lot of other big companies that are very focused on open source software. Um, but it does seem that a lot of the focus is in the industry and is in big companies. Uh, as far as the community scale, and there's a couple other lugs around LA, but we're definitely one of the biggest on the West Side, and we're still not very big. But it, I think it helps that we're part of a university, also. So, do you guys meet on a uh, regular basis? Um, yeah. So we have meetings every week. Okay. Okay. And how and was the attendance like on those? 
So we probably have seven or eight extremely active people who come to every meeting. Um, we have a lot of legacy users and one of the and a lot of legacy members, and we have and a lot of people hang on to RSC or will come to install fest and stuff. Um, but in terms of active, is maybe ten people, so it's still not very many um, that come to every single meeting or whatever. I mean, I well, go ahead. I mean, I was gonna say for the longest time, I actually uh, hung out in the IRC right. of a Linux user group that started out actually as an Ubuntu loco. They were Ubuntu loco Kentucky, and then they went to Bluegrass Linux user group. And it was active for a while. I went to a few meetings in 2011, mm -hmm. um, and but it's really tapered off. A lot of the m major members moved down to Texas, I think, and then I'm, I myself ended up moving out to Kansas. Yeah. See, I, I found it moved the other way. Where where I am, there was a a, a distinct move from geographically centered Linux user groups. Like in the UK, you have one per county, and I'm sure you have one per state or one per city in the US. Um, it moved to a UK-wide Ubuntu loco. Like I moved that way, and a lot of people moved that way too. And then there were various other distro-specific groups as well, which kind of made the locos, uh, the, the lugs somewhat less populated and less um, less utilized. Geographically... Hmm. I have to say that's a, probably a lot easier to do in the UK than it would be in the United States. Yeah, yeah, sure. In my in my yeah. area, yeah, it's very true. From uh, my, the the user group in my area is very scarce. So there was one lug that was here for a couple of years, and it's been just disbanded. But the the it's been replaced by a meetup group for just Linux users. Yeah, I think is it just the thing that hindered me from going to a lot of meetings is. I was in Louisville, Kentucky, and you know I was younger at the time, and most of the meetings were over in Lexington, Kentucky. So a majority yeah. of the time, I couldn't make it. Yeah, see, like I'm in North Georgia, and like closest person that uses Linux that I know personally, is, I mean I don't know him, but is Brian. He was probably like an hour for me. <laughs> just kind of give you an example. Hmm. Like, yeah. It's just spread out all over the place. I now. mean, is is there some value in a Linux users group that exists virtually? Like this mumble room right now is as big as some lug attendees are, right? And the IRC right. is many times larger right now. 367 people in the IRC right now are chatting about Linux-related topics way bigger than a local lug. So is the amount of connectivity and the frequency of connectivity and the availability of information and help does that in some ways i guess if the end goal is linux adoption if the end goal is getting people using linux doesn't this new model where the lug plays less of a role still promote linux on the desktop more i completely yeah, I, agree and, I remember and the reason that. being is that like in my area there aren't very many even computer user groups let alone Linux user groups, or even, um, you know, I was looking for an Ubuntu loco for some time ago. The closest one is in over the Seattle area, and then there's another one that's in Boise, Idaho. Right, That's yeah. the next closest. Right. That's just how it is here, too. There's, like, nothing computer, like, related groups yeah. like that. Yeah, that's a big factor, especially in the U.S., is there's massive groups of areas that don't have uh, other, you know, technology enthusiast groups. But, but yeah. at the same time, going back to the IRC thing, like, yeah. IRC has been around since like the dawn of time. So yeah, Here in uh, Kansas, <laughs> the local, the closest Linux user group to me is the Kansas City, Missouri one, although that doesn't seem all that well, active. It's It's more than that, I see. It's, like, for me, I live in a huge city center. I live in, in Toronto, it's, and I can't get to their local user group because it's so packed and I'm on such a Whoa. small time strength. Interesting. I also think I that, you know, the the idea that the an online friendship or an online relationship is a lot considered a lot more legitimate these days than it was ten years ago. True. True. Yeah. Well, so, I remember so I, some some five six years ago when Lug Radio, uh, John O'Bacon, Stuart Language um, podcast was was going. Right. Um, there's a guy in France. Uh, there's a, there's an IRC channel and it's still going now. Hash Lug Radio on Freenode. Long after the podcast finished, podcast finished um, years ago. Six six years ago, and the IRC channel is still there, and people still come in there and say good morning, morning everyone. There's still a community around it, and I remember Bruno. Um, 
a guy from France who was who was um, uh, listened to the the podcast and was you know uh, always in the IRC channel said Lug Radio is my lug and and these and this was five six years ago he saw this mm-hmm. online virtual community as his Linux user group as the people yeah. who was empath- yeah. empathic with well, that he could I mean, you know, relate to this could be the Irish schnapps talking but you guys literally are my lug. Really? Yeah. I love you too. I mean, well, same here. Yeah. You know, Chris, when you mentioned something earlier about, you know, when you met Brian Brian at the uh, Linux Fest Northwest, you know, that kind of reminded me how uh, earlier this year I also helped Brian pack his stuff uh, when he was moving from southern Indiana down right. to Georgia. Right. Well, that is really the interesting thing is there are members in uh, like our IRC chat room that have then met up in real life. Like, Brian, didn't you meet up with Mail Holler? Uh, twice, actually, yeah. met up with uh, met up with Tyler Mailhaller and his entire family, and uh, you, Angela, and uh, Ty the Geek over at North North uh, Fest Linux Fest. So yeah. yeah, lots of people. I mean, it That's is quite a long haul for Brian too. From and I actually plan on starting early this year, saving up to get a plane ticket to head out towards Linux Fest Northwest in April. Oh, man. Awesome. See, this makes me want to get the studio started up because then we could have like yeah. a spot for everybody to come hang out after Linux Fest Northwest. That would be Yeah, cool. I would love to go up there too. Yeah, that would be a lot of fun. Yeah, I think this right. is what's well, happened to Lugs is that all the simple support stuff has gone online. Right. And now it's just the dedicated users that go to these hyper um, focused events like hacker spaces or um, in their towns or these See, conventions. Hacker spaces are different though because hackers are like more. Pe- like Peter, like Sitchik focus. It's not right. 100% so, Linux. It's not like this hacking on random things. So there's a big overlap there, though. Uh, yep. If I go to any of my um, hack spaces nearby, the, the, they're the same kind of people, like, you know, people who want to take things apart make them work the way they want to don't necessarily want to use devices the way that the manufacturer intended they're the same right. Right. kind of ethic that, yep. that we have yeah it is so, so i totally agree with popey um because at least in la we have devops la meetups and different infrastructure um like industry type uh, user groups and in many ways i think those have replaced the lug movement because as more and more people want linux professionals they kind of congregate within their own professional groups rather than these informal um, lug type situations. Well, and it's interesting too, as new Linux based technologies take off like Android online, the the communities solely seem to be forming online, right? Like I, and, and, and and very large ones like the XDA form. Oh, blue Phoenix actually just had an awesome idea. What if you got your new studio and turn it into a Jupiter broadcasting hacker space? Oh, that would be cool. You know what we do? We would have a garage, so there is possibilities. And, be, you know, if you, had a new, if you made off. that new studio, you could have a, have a couple interns, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, interesting thoughts. You know, I'd love to hear also if the anyone out in the download audience has experience with uh, a local Linux users group or runs one or is involved with one. We'd love to hear what you think. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com and pop that contact link at the top of the site. There is actually a Linux Unplugged drop down there. Uh, any other uh, closing thoughts, you guys, like uh, on the uh, on the uh, lug topic? Well, I have one. Uh, I, all I got to say what? is coming April, party at the JB studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. Like a oh, or something. Uh, all right, well, Matt. Also, yeah, when it comes to things, mm-hmm. well, party I was going for most not. of this topic. Well, for me, there is value all to those groups. In person. Well, all those groups, they're more of the fallout from the old school computer cl- clubs right. that used to do the right. old hardware I stuff agree. and the old OS stuff. But I, now, I, don't, like then, I, I wouldn't discount them because of that, though. Well, they never had the internet back at that time. No, I, just I agree. It's like invented. But there is something about seeing somebody else do something in Linux that makes you go, oh, I could do that. When oh, you yeah. see it happen, like I'll tell you this, but the only reason I say this is because for years, I went to clients, and uh, and a few of these clients, I would have like the tech savvy guy or gal that worked there, who was like the tech person for the company. And when she would see Compiz on my Linux machine, that was the coolest thing ever, and that made her or him want to run Linux. If I if I can say something, so uh, honestly, side. that kind of concept is what I can actually because I say my first. Uh, experience with that was actually watching the Linux Action Show, and that's kind of how I got into it in the first place. And now so, you're now you're spinning out your own distro. Yes. Yeah, that's well, interesting. 
So I think for myself, what really killed the whole lug situation really comes down to the following. I, you know, I poked in and out of the Bellingham lug for a few years. I mean, just, just real occasional. And I, I found it remarkable how it felt like Groundhog Day. Nothing really, no new faces, always mm. the same folks, great folks, awesome people. Yeah. But it was just the same thing. Yeah, over I can see and that. Over and, and honestly, it's like even online, it's hard to get that stale. So for me, it was, my, I, I stopped attending just because I was really not getting anything new from it. Everybody used OpenSUSE, and if you didn't, you weren't, you know, or not OpenSUSE, but a SUSE at the time. You know, you, it's just, it was very much a, it was very much an echo chamber. So, yeah, I could see the echo chamber and like the same old stories over yep, and over again. Right. So that sounds like a, a lug that's kind of given up on recruiting and they're kind of in a, a rut because we've had an experience where this year we did a pretty heavy recruiting uh, drive with all the tech, the uh, uh, club fairs and stuff at our school. Yeah. Uh, and just we've got, blood. It's basically just about you need to, because we're in a, a room in the bottom of a, the engineering building and yeah. unless you know about us, unless you have discovery, no one's going to, no one's going to know we're here. Cox, oh, yeah, I would totally. say from what you're saying is that the lug is most likely to live on the best in a college campus. That's yeah, what, I would agree with I that. Mean, so, and the thing is, is the college campus doesn't really, uh, as much as, I mean, I, I totally, I, I dig that Cognizu was talking about a lug and that's awesome. But to me, it seems like it's only successful because you kind of have a captive audience. It's easy to message to them because they're all in one location and they're sort of already there. And but, you got people churn. You got new faces at least. Right. Oh, but great isn't point. that what a business would want if they want to hire people who know Linux? Wouldn't they want to team up with somebody who's attracting other young, fresh blood who are coming through the colleges? Well, so, I, so I, it's, I really it's to, funny you mentioned that. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that because that's one of the primary reasons we exist. Uh-huh. Is uh-huh. Our school is a typical high level CS department where they really don't teach a lot of practical skills. Because in CS and academic level is almost like math. It's like math for computer programs. And to teach, like, for example, um, I've been doing a lot of work professionally with, with Puppet and very, de- very different DevOps, Vagrant stuff uh, type um, continuous integration stuff. And that, those are skills that I basically taught myself. And I've gotten jobs because I've known these skills, like uh, mm-hmm. these skills from teaching myself. And when there's an interest group, where they, we give talks about these things and we have other people who are interested in them. Like I've had, I'm not gonna name names, I think it's probably not the best thing, but we've had very massive companies come and trying to to partner directly with us and give sponsor talks and things to try and attract uh, our uh, members. So they're looking for talent, they're looking for hires? Yeah, so like I've gotten three jobs from, I don't know, I don't know if it's directly from the lug, but oh. it's from um, just knowing these things and having that kind of interest. I mean, that, that actually makes a lot of sense, right? Because these companies don't know quite how to find these people. And a lug is something they can see, something they understand, something they can approach. And they can come to the lug and say, we're looking for somebody who is talented in NGINX, and, et cetera, et cetera, right? And- so, so this is something that is actually, I was talking to the Facebook recruiter and she was telling me, okay, so Facebook has this um, position called production engineer. And the reason this position exists is because the software engineers they hire don't know enough about the infrastructure backbone to make right, the, right. the kind of um, uh, decisions they have to make about how will this application run in production. Sure, sure. And so a lot of what happens is a software engineer will end up learning a lot of these skills after they've been on the job for a while and then transition to this role. Well, an- another thing is, is if you remember at Linux Fest Northwest, uh, Chris, that um, lots of job recruiting people are also there like... Um, Dice.com was there. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. You know, that's a great point. Uh, and I think part of that is because um, some of these companies have their foot in the old world and they really haven't figured out how to approach a community. Like, if you think about it, like if you were trying to hire a sysadmin or you're trying to hire somebody to take care of your back end infrastructure, dude, I would totally troll the Linux Action Show subreddit. But these companies haven't figured it out, right? They haven't figured it out. But what they have figured out is lugs and user conferences. That's a great point I didn't even think about. Hmm. And now that I think about it, if I was going to hire somebody for like to, to handle the Jupiter Broadcasting back end, that's probably where I would look too, actually. <laughs> yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it does make a lot of sense. I never even thought about the employment aspect. And so, I mean, that's probably another argument for like, how do we figure out how to rejuvenate the lug? And does it need to be rebooted? Does it... 
Okay, let me ask you, okay, Mumble Room, let me ask you this. And Popey, I want to start with you because you're the one that brought up the topic, so I think you should get first shot at this. Could a uh-huh. uh, could a Google Hangout replace a lug? No, because the the people that you want to get involved are highly opinionated and but, okay. um, now, the, reason, but the kind of on. people who wouldn't touch Google Hangouts with a barge pole. Well, okay, I'll, I'll give you that on the last part, but uh, let's look at the uh, the uh, Ubuntu Developer Summits. You guys have moved to uh, to these virtual summits, and you're still getting a lot of stuff done. There's a lot of discussions that are happening. People are able to attend because they're able to just connect in. They're, you're seeing your, each other face to face. I mean, there's product there's productivity happening there. Isn't it better than nothing? Uh, yeah, but but UDS is a very different animal than lugs. Um, and, and, and we are, we we all have Google accounts by virtue of the fact that, you know, we, we have a corporate oh, Google yeah. setup, you know, so oh, that's, that's a good point. That, Not everybody but, has a Google account, but lugs, you know, uh, are the, the place where you find people who buy Android phones and then immediately flash them. So they don't ever have to connect to Google or the kinds of people who refuse to have smartphones. I'm not saying there's anything bad about that, but they're, 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 it's a different type of person in a lug. All right. Than- Isn't that the problem? Don't we need to reboot the lug and make it more modernized? That way, guys like me who want – as t- I want a 12-core processor. Maybe I want two of them in my box. I want 64 gigs of RAM. Let's reboot the lug for that guy. Yeah, for so you, so you're lug, saying – That's out really those exactly people. what to turn it into. Having it turn into a hackfest type thing would be more similar to the old school's lug. Yeah. At the same time, though, that's like Linux was for those people who wanted not to use them, like, like is for open and free software and not like Hangouts. So, also, when you're in some, person, all the creative juices happen a little bit better and you're more competitive when you're in person versus just over hmm, the that's internet. That's interesting. That it makes you think, think better and more harder. Like, it makes you think better and harder about what the hell to counteract this guy's idea. A few years ago, um, on OMG Ubuntu, which is a popular blog you may have heard of, no, um, <laughs> never heard of it. Just a guy going. called uh, Benjamin Humphrey, who used to write for them, wrote a post about neck beards, and um, <laughs> he he got a, a massive uh, negative feedback uh, from the community because oh, really? he was he was basically having a pop at people in the way that you're suggesting that you know we should move on and and maybe you know the, the we should uh, involve younger blood who want you know faster processors and the you know the javascript and that kind of you know the 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 thing of today rather than cobol sir, and mainframes and really sixes sir, you're you are blaming me for stereotyping when you are saying that all of these people at lugs are old school mainframe cobol guys and i'm saying that stereotyping a lug you are really sir really no sir. what i'm saying is that he made that he made that kind of suggestion and he got a lot of flack for it and mm, and rightly so because I gotcha. he's what what the I thought it was a ballsy was, argument, was actually that 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 people um what you're doing now and and in the future is built on the shoulders of what the people did before you. If yeah. those lugs didn't exist yeah. three years ago, yeah. ten years ago, right. then you know your podcast wouldn't exist. Yeah, isn't that and true? Do you see what I mean? What's yeah, I out, do. What's, what's come this out of this podcast to me is, is almost that need- like the recording of a huge lug meeting. <laughs> I'd say a community, yeah. though, has yeah. to center so, itself around far more than just yeah. a Google Plus Hangout. There needs well, to be more substance stuff, to it. But you've also got to have, you've got to close the loop locally, like what's happening at Cogsu's college. So you need two separate things. The hmm. online stuff is going to solve itself and happen and is happening right now. But you need to close the loop locally. I, I think you might be onto something there because uh, going back to the Linux Fest Northwest, it's like it's it is truly one thing to to know these people and hear their voices, but to actually shake their hand, see them as a human, uh, with their with their flaws and with their pluses that you never knew about until you saw them personally, like and uh, beards. like uh, I really really love my truck. Okay, I really <laughs> love my truck, and I gave the keys to my truck to Brian twenty forty. Uh, and I think that the, I, no other man as far, uh, maybe with the exception of one or two other men have ever driven my truck and will never drive my truck. I will make that point right now. We'll never drive my truck, but I gave it to Brian 2040. Part of it was because I knew him in the IRC, but then I met him and there's a connection that is made. Uh, and it's interesting. I think get a room. 
Well, <laughs> I, I, I remember Chris standing out there with a boom box in his bathroom. <laughs> but you, you also had to point out you were violently ill as well. So I was quite sick. My breathed. options were limited. That is I true. I remember very clearly as Chris looks me dead in the eyes, deadpan serious, and says, dude, I don't feel good. And I was like, oh, okay. Right. He's like, no, no, Matt, really. I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> and, I'm, and, I'm, and I'm just like, I'm just like, oh, crap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We were, like, we were actually all concerned because Chris went out into his car and then it was just nothing for like two hours. Yeah. Well, it was funny. He died. I was like, I kept like, I kept thinking like, I'll get better. I'll get better. I'll be all but, right. I'll be but okay. But I will and- tell you that it wasn't for Angela coming in and like basically looping all of us together. Cause we were a bunch of trained monkeys going in circles. <laughs> she was the one that set us straight and made sure we got things done. So I'm going to get, I got to get props to her on that one. Big time. It's like, it's like, Big time. I'll be all right. It's just a flesh wound. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. No, he was so, so I felt so bad. I, I oh, totally yeah, see the, really clo- I see the closing the loop argument. Mm-hmm. Um, but unfortunately that's not a practical, like, so if people are listening to us in the UK, like they can't, they they can't realistically attend Linux Fest Northwest and shake our hand. So I want to offer something to them. I want to say to them that even though you're not visiting a lug, you're still part of an overall larger community. Yeah. Well, Hugs I, for lugs. Hugs. For <laughs> guys. What Two you lugs, need not is you need to start a fundraiser so you could take a trip with the family over to the United Kingdom to have a meet up there. Once I get the uh, staying on the air thing figured out and the studio thing figured out and the doing Linux action shows and Linux unplugs on location thing figured out, then it's the travel to the UK <laughs> thing I got to figure out. That's so, all. Chris, let me know. Let me know when you're coming over to the UK so I can go to another country. Ouch. It hurts. Oh. Popey, that hurts on the inside. Deep Shots down. Popey's got a very strong We're Americans. We like our little angry bubble. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we love our ignorance. Okay, now this is... second show at Canonical. This is the oh boy. These are the oh, final wow. uh, final thoughts. You know, uh, the only oh, action show went down to the Ubuntu One conference back when they did these things in the meat space, and that was a good time. That was actually a really good time. Meat space, huh? Uh, so, all right. Any final thoughts, you guys, on the lug? I know uh, Ixy, you were thinking about where, Ixel. What you think about starting the lug on your on your own? Uh, I thought about it and kind of, it, you know, played around with the idea. Yeah. But with me moving, there's no real sense in doing it over here. So, I mean. If anybody else saw, like in the chat room, I saw somebody else from the Spokane area. Oh, he just found SpokaneLinux.org. How about that? <laughs> that actually be pretty cool. All right. Well, uh, it's an interesting topic, and it's one that I'd love to hear the uh, audience sort of at large. Like, I, I wonder if if maybe because we're living on the West Coast, we're right by. We're. I mean. I think I'm, I think I could get to Microsoft in 45 minutes if I if if traffic. Oh, you was could good. throw rocks at them from right. Your house. So <laughs> maybe they're interfering with my thought process just because of the proximity. So if you are living out there and you have a rock and lug, and we'd love to hear about it. And and I know they're out there. Like our Bellingham lug uh, puts on Linux Fest Northwest every single year, and those guys are awesome. And the Everett lug is nearby, and they're working out on some pretty cool stuff. But I'd love to hear what you guys are doing. So go over to JupiterBroadcasting.com and pop that contact link. And uh, let us know uh, what's happening in your neck of the woods. And don't forget, we're doing a double back, back to back special of uh, Linux Unplugged next week. So uh, join us for that. We'd love to get you in the mumble room. That'll be on uh, the 17th, starting at 12 p.m. Pacific over at JBLive.tv. Don't know what time that is in your local area? That's okay. It's okay. We got it. It's we got right. a jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar, and it uses secret technology that automatically converts it to your local time zone. I don't even know how that's possible. It's some sort munchkins of munchkins and gremlins. It's, and a, it's some sort of yeah, munch yeah, exactly right. I think we've had munchkins and gremlins that have been working on our website uh, named uh, Heimer sixteen, and they are incredible. <laughs> All right, Matt. Well, uh, coming up on Sunday, we'll have a look at the Leopard Extreme. I'm punishing it right now as we speak. Punishing. So, uh, and I know uh, we've got more to talk about too. So, uh, I want awesome. everybody to go over to uh, JupiterBroadcasting.com and go watch our last episode of Linux Action Show if you didn't catch that. And then tune in next week. We got a big one where I'm taking Leopard Extreme, the real System76 Mac Pro competitor, and we'll see how it ho- holds up to a production uh, workload. Definitely. All right, man. Well, I'll see you on Sunday, okay? See you on Sunday. Okay, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. We'll see you on Sunday for the big show, and we'll see you right back here on Tuesday for the next episode of Linux Unplugged. Thanks so much. Thank you.